Stanford University. Thank you, Uj. <laughs> and welcome. Good morning. All right. I'm impressed that you have so much energy at 9 a.m. So at your 9 a.m. classes next week, yeah. Uh, welcome to first lecture. And it is a new tradition at Stanford. Last year was the first, this is the second. And essentially what first lecture, what we're doing is looking at the notion of liberal education and asking one of our professors to talk about that subject. And we're really fortunate today to have Ivan Bolin to deliver the first lecture. Ivan Bolin was born in Dublin, Ireland, and educated in London, New York, and Dublin. She has taught at Trinity College, University College Dublin, at Bowdoin College, and was a member of the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. She was poet in residence at the National Maternity Hospital. Um, she has also been the Hearst Professor of Was at Washington University and a Regents Lecturer at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, she's on the board of the Irish Arts Council and a member of the Irish Academy of Letters. She is on the advisory board of the International Writers' Center at WashU. She is the Mar Maybury Knapp Professor in the Humanities at Stanford University and the Lane Professor for Director of Creating Writing, Creative Writing at Stanford. She is regarded as the first major woman poet in the Irish poetic tradition. During the past three decades, she almost single-handedly transformed the language and changed the course of Irish poetry. Ireland, and she says, is a country where, with a fairly conservative view of women. We're putting together the word woman and poet had not happened before, she said recalling her struggle with the literary establishment. Quote, it's a country that has learned a lot of hard lessons, end of quote. As a young lecturer at Trinity College and as a columnist for the Irish Times, Professor Boland started to argue in the 1960s that the great bardic poets of the past had fused the nation's story with the idealized feminine. She maintained that Irish poetry had objectified women as passive metaphors, emblematic muses, and decorative motifs. Quote, I knew that the women of the Irish past were defeated, she wrote in a memoir, Object Lessons, The Life of Women and the Poets in Our Times. Quote, what I objected to was that Irish poetry should defeat, defeat them twice. A trailblazer, Bolin insisted that female icons needed to walk out of poems and become authors. She has published 10 volumes of poetry. Her books of poetry include Against Love Poetry, which a New York Times was a New York Times notable book in 2001. Also, The Lost Land, In a Time of Violence, Outside History, Selected Poems, 1980 to 1990. In addition to her books of poetry, Professor Bolin is the author of Object Lessons, The Life of a Woman and a Poet in Our Time, and co-editor of The Making of a Poem, a Norton Anthology of Poetic Forms, and The Making of a Sonnet, a Noet Anthology of the Sonnet. She has published a volume of translations called Every, After Every War with Princeton University, and her uh, new collected poems was published by Norton in 2008. And in 2011, she published A Journey with Two Maps, Becoming a Woman Poet, which won the 2012 Penn Award. She has many awards, including a Lannan Foundation Award in Poetry, an American Ireland Fund Literary Award, a Corrington Medal for Literary Excellence from the Centenary, and she has honorary um, doctorates from the University of College Dublin, Trinity College Dublin, uh, Strathclyde University Scotland, Bowdoin College, and Colby College. With her leadership, creative writing program at Stanford is one of, if not the best program in the world. According to Professor Bolin, one of the greatest advantages to the creative writing program at Stanford is its location at a university that is strong in both technical degrees and the humanities. The diversity of education on the campus fosters a creative environment for the arts to take root. With regard to poetry specifically, Professor Bolin says she believes that this interdisciplinarity works so well because, quote, no good poem comes from one intellectual direction or another, end of quote. 
She feels Stanford's diverse academic environment allows literature to find relevancy through all spectrums of the human experience. Quote, poetry doesn't e seek to be a commodity. It doesn't change history or events. It changes people. So you see why she is such an excellent person. And it is my pleasure to do introduce Professor Ivan Bolin to deliver the first lecture. Uh, first of all, just let me thank Professor Ilam for that extremely kind introduction. And to begin by saying that I have the honor of being among the very many people here who want to welcome you who are freshmen to Stanford University. You know, it has to be uh, a joy and maybe even a relief uh, to many of you to be here today just as it is a joy for us to see you here. Uh, I think we all know the struggle and the dedication it takes to come here. And we can try to imagine the late hours, the times you chose to work rather than do something else, write that last essay, read that last page. And now you have come to a great university, which is where you wanted to be, and now the future is in front of you. And now what? As well as being among those who welcome you, I have the privilege this morning in this first lecture of trying to put certain ideas in front of you and trying to ask certain questions, which I'm asking now, which I think you probably will end up asking yourself over the next four years. I am going to talk this morning, as the first lecture is intended to, about a liberal education. I'm going to talk about the strengths of it and I realize how abstract that just has to sound. But during the next four years, those words, a liberal education, are going to be a living part of your environment. Every time you choose one class over another, thank you. Every time you choose one class over another, or one course over another, or finally select one major instead of another, you are going to be at the heart of what a liberal education means. So it does seem appropriate to talk about it here at the very beginning of your time at Stanford. I'm going to try to go over three main points in this talk and illustrate them as well as I can and in as interesting a way as I can, both from my own personal experience and from my experience here at Stanford as a teacher. There are three points. The first of the points about liberal education is that it is an education that can help to get rid of the false divisions that have often been created between different ways of knowing the world, between science and arts, for instance, between knowledge and imagination. And I'm going to illustrate that to you from my own experience as a student. The second point, I think, is a very important one. And it is that a liberal education doesn't just develop ability, it also discovers it. It encourages a student to strike out in the search for that discovery in all kinds of new directions and find all kinds of strengths they really didn't know they had. And the third point, which I'm going to try to illustrate with the story of one particular student here, is how liberal education can help a student unite very different fields of study and knowledge into one intellectual purpose. So even with those three points, I, I know we are still left with the central question, what is a liberal education? Strange enough, despite the, the use of the term, it isn't that easy to define. When people talk about it, certain terms keep coming up communications, creativity, and judgment. But how exactly are those words going to be real to you as a student just at the start of your education here this morning? So maybe I should try to make some generalizations just before I get to the specific points. To start with, I think you will find very quickly that a liberal education at Stanford is not a curriculum or a structure 
or a requirement, although, of course, it works through all of them. It's not an education that cuts a clear, linear path through things. It isn't structured in any authoritarian way. It's much more likely to hold out that invitation to new and surprising pathways. So what is it that a liberal education has achieved that would make you, unlike a student of 100 years ago, be glad that you've come here to get that kind of education? To start with, and among other things, it is liberal education that got rid of the notorious ivory tower, which was the name people gave to everything they thought was wrong with education. The ivory tower was the tabloid name used to designate seclusion, a retreat from the world. It meant separating the person with knowledge from the person without it, making a privileged caste of those who have it against those who don't. The liberal education is just the opposite. It wants its graduates to go into the world to share their knowledge, to bring their vision and their conscience and their competence with them. So a liberal education doesn't ask for a clever or programmed mind, but it does look for an open one. And above all, liberal education seeks to lift knowledge out of the category of what is simply obtained and made use of and it elevates it to the category of what can be understood and loved and handed on. And when we get right down to the practical points of what use is a liberal education in the world outside this university, when you leave the university and you go to that world, then I really think the answer has to be crystal clear. What employer, what institution, what community would not seek out the person who has not just acquired knowledge, but learned to relate to it with passion and conviction. And that is what the education here will offer you at Stanford. Having said all that, I do know that that language still sounds vague and it still sounds propagandist. The advocacy coming at you this morning, right on the threshold of things, has to sound up in the air. So I thought I would get maybe personal for a moment and take up that first point I made, that a liberal education can help to get rid of those false divisions that once existed, that have been created and once actually were set in stone, looking at different ways of knowing the world and false divisions we carried with us and which I found out in different circumstances when I was a student in Dublin. So let me tell you a little bit about myself which will explain some of the ideas I put in front of you today. Just to begin with, I'm Irish. I was born in Dublin. It was a very literary city when I was young. It was the city of James Joyce and William Yeats and Sean O'Casey and George Bernard Shaw, all of them writers who are important well beyond the shores of Ireland. Two of them won the Nobel Prize, but three of those four did not go to university. And if Dublin was a literary city, it was not, unfortunately, when I was young, an educated one. When I was young and beginning there, only one in 20 young people could go to university. So many families found it just too difficult to do without the income a child could bring into a house when they left school. So the first thing I thought of, and I hope I did think of, was that I was fortunate to have the chance to go to college. I had the chance, and I went to the college I wanted to go to, which was the Story Trinity College, right in the heart of Dublin, almost beside the River Liffey, and looking out to College Green, as it still does. I went to Trinity, which is in fact where my father went, but I did not go there without a great deal of suspicion and doubt. In fact, I almost believe that there were hardly many students who started their undergraduate careers with as much suspicion as I did, and I'll tell you why. As I saw it, as a teenager, as someone who loved the country I was born in, education had just not been a major part of the Irish experience. What had formed Irish culture, it seemed to me, was not education, but imagination. 
Ireland had produced a great literature against the odds, and I had come to idealize the world of history and language and song and struggle which Irish literature stood for. At 18, which is when I went to Trinity, it was that world of imagination I admired. And it was that world of imagination I hoped to belong to as a poet. It seemed to me that world really didn't need the confirmation of any educational institution. It stood alone. It was what defined us as an Irish people. And yet here I was about to go to an educational institution. And to complicate it still further, just in the last weeks before I went to Trinity, in that September, I was reading a little book, and it was called The Hidden Ireland by Daniel Corkery, tiny, out-of-date paperback. I took the book with me absolutely everywhere. It described the poor and ruined Gaelic poets of the 18th century in Ireland. It told the story of those poets in a small Kerry village, just when they'd lost their language, just when they'd lost their patrons, and they walked the roads as their words fell apart, and British colonial rule became established. They were poor, but most importantly, those poets couldn't read and they couldn't write. But they lived for centuries afterwards in the memories of the Irish people. And there was one sentence that I read almost every day before I went to college, and this was the sentence about those poets. The poetry of these men, this is from the book. Though doubtless it is the poorest chapter in the book of Irish literature, is in itself no poor thing that needs excuse. It is, on the contrary, a rich thing, a marvelous inheritance, bright with music, flushed with color, deep with human feeling. To see it against the dark world that threw it up is to be astonished, if not dazzled. So there I was at 18, already convinced that the values that would guide me were those of imagination, doubtful about going to a university where there was structure and study and a canon and a history of literature I wasn't sure could ever be mine. Those poets of the 18th century, I said to myself, they couldn't read or write. How would this university in the middle of Dublin, founded on the skills of reading and writing, ever help me keep the admiration of those poets who didn't share those skills. Well, I went to Trinity, and of course it transformed my view. I found, like so many people before me, not immediately, but gradually, in the seminars, the halls, and the friendships, and the lectures I went to, that there was a value system at university which made room for my own, that the love of literature and language is not the exclusive property of one country or one canon. No one came to me at Trinity to try to take away my image of the splendor of those non-literate Irish poets. Instead, I was shown how to fit them into their time and their context so as to understand them better. No one suggested to me that an unliterate poet wasn't worth studying. What they said was that education was broader and better for including the existence of those writers. Above all, I left Trinity College with the understanding that there is no conflict between imagination and knowledge. There wasn't then and there isn't now. The barriers and false distinctions I brought with me through the front gate, I didn't leave with when I left Trinity. And so in the process, without knowing it, without having a name for it, I became the beneficiary of a liberal education. And without that education, I would have been less prepared to be a person and a poet. Now, I, I know that my own story is very particular and very personal, and it also belongs in a city far away in a different university and at a very different time. And there is just no doubt that in terms of education, things have moved on in remarkable ways. I see that all around me. The English department at Stanford, which is led by our colleague, Professor Gavin Jones, is truly a wonderful department. I hope many of you will become English majors. I was an English major at Trinity, though it had another name. But there is a huge difference between then and now. I 
would have thought that I could walk into a classroom at Trinity and expect to receive good and helpful education. But it would never have occurred to me that I could walk into that classroom and change it by debate, by ideas, by choices, by my participation. But you will be able to do this here as an English major, and in any major, you'll be encouraged to do it. The classroom is not the space it once was. It is a much more plastic entity, and it's much more a lo location of change. So speaking of false divisions, I should say that Stanford University has a long-standing commitment to removing those divisions. Science, technology, the arts, and the professions are all given shelter here. They can all connect with each other. That in itself is innovative compared with 100 years ago. There was a time when nobody thought those fields of study could or should connect. It was once thought that the humanist and the scientist and the social scientist were in separate kingdoms of knowledge. But even if you go back four decades at Stanford, that wasn't true. Stanford was leading forward in a way to try to get all those to speak to each other. And I know that because of something in my office, which dates back to the year 1959, which I can tell you about. To understand that, you have to go back to the year 1959 with me for a minute. And that's when Stanford was leading forward in a branch of philosophy called decision theory. It was the actual study of how decisions were made. There was an eminent professor, Supers, who was director of the Institute for Mathematical Studies and the Social Sciences at that time. And in 1959 also, there was a professor, John McCarthy, who hadn't yet come to Stanford. He was at MIT. But he was just about to come here to begin a long and very brilliant study of artificial intelligence. So if you have artificial intelligence and decision theory as great pillars of thought. And now when I go into my office, I think about this because there's a bookshelf. I direct creative writing this bookshelf just opposite my desk, which contains all the books of the writers who came as Stegner Fellows or Fellows to Stanford uh, since the 40s. And there's one particular book directly across from me that reminds me of that year, 1959, when Professor Soups and Professor McCarthy were getting ready to change the world. Just in that year, a young misfit came to Stanford and he wrote his book at Stanford in the creative writing program. His name was Ken Kesey and the book he wrote was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Now, that's maybe a very small anecdote, to have the best of artificial intelligence as well as the best of creative intelligence under one roof doesn't really guarantee anything, I suppose. But it does prove that Stanford has been remarkably hospitable for a very long time to very different ways of knowing the world. And that in itself is one of the ways of describing liberal education. Now, when these points are put in front of you, even with the questions, even with examples, I do know that it doesn't cover the very real challenges that you're going to have as students day by day at this campus in selecting the courses you take. And, you know, I wanted to bring in something that was down to earth, and there was a paragraph that really struck me last November in a newspaper you're going to be reading, the Stanford Daily, the student newspaper, they were thinking aloud about what liberal education means. And it provoked a very lively debate on this campus. It's a debate that goes forward. But I was struck by the paragraph in the Stanford Daily because it was students speaking to students. And they had it in the most practical language. And this is the paragraph that seemed to me to ask some very key questions that I know you'll ask yourself. This is what the paragraph said. Although a liberal education might once have been valued for the purpose of educating the future elite and upper class social norms, such as understanding Greek in the 21st century, a more practical justification is in order. There are at least two such justifications. One is that in exposing all students to a wide range of fields, requiring a liberal education can help students find new intellectual passions. <laughs> 
given that many Stanford students ultimately major in something completely different from what they originally intended, this benefit can't be ignored. However, we also have to justify the liberal education for those students who are completely certain of their major and their future career. So a common question asked by critiques of a liberal education goes something like this. Why should an English major, dead set on writing for a living, need to take classes in math, science, and engineering? That extract from the Daily makes a key point. How w will you decide here what's right for you? How are you going to go through the four years of education with the difficult decisions it means for you? And how will you be certain at any point that a liberal education really is best for you? <clears throat> it's your own choices that matter in this. Will you, for instance, take the course you planned on that leads you straight to the goal of the future as you understand it? Or will you try something different, something right outside what you expected you'd try when you came to university? In creative writing every day, we have science students writing short stories, and we have chemists writing poems. And I'm sure there are at least a few of those students truly surprised to find themselves going out of their way, combining the arts with something in the sciences. Somewhere along that path in the next four years, you will rightly question whether a liberal education is the right one. I believe there are arguments as to why it is. So let me put one in front of you, which I think is really the strongest. A liberal education offers something I believe no other method of education does offer. Many forms of education, what was called in Europe the old grammarian system, where students filed into a classroom and sat in silence for an hour as an instructor talked. Many of those systems did develop intellectual ability. They imparted knowledge, and they offered skill, and they trained ability. And it wouldn't make any sense to say that students didn't benefit by that. In many cases, and in many cultures, it was the only education that was on offer. But the students' participation was not sought. The students' viewpoint wasn't consulted. Do I think the older system was wrong? The word is not wrong, but there was a cost. I do believe, as a teacher, that a classroom is not and should not be an enactment of a power relation, where one side has all the knowledge and all the authority. Instead, a classroom, and this is the view of liberal education, ought to be an enactment of a conversation, a rich, sustaining conversation where the exchanges become part of the sum of knowledge gained, and I think that is always going to be part of things here. But the liberal education offers you at Stanford isn't just different because the style of the classroom has changed. It's different because of that thing I said, which is my second point. The older systems developed ability, but this system has the power to discover it in you. And there's all the difference in the world between developing intellectual ability and discovering it. There's an enormous sense of excitement and confirmation in suddenly finding you have a strength, an ability that you never suspected and never would have suspected, which happened because you did that class or you signed up for that seminar or you took a risk or took on a minor that was far from your expected pathway. A liberal education doesn't just allow for it, it encourages it and seeks to achieve it. It holds out its hand to you with surprising invitations. And the word liberal in that phrase, liberal education, doesn't mean an external freedom from pressure or challenge. It means the internal freedom to follow those discoveries where they take you. Above all, liberal education doesn't just invite you to try new things. It shows you how to relate what you didn't know to what you always did. So because that, again, sounds theoretical, I want to make my third point, which I'm very glad to do, choosing a, an illustration, which I'm very glad to have. So let me give you the example of a student who not so long ago was exactly where you are, just at the start of their four years at Stanford. This student came to see me late in their freshman year, and they asked me informally to advise them. And th this student, he, he wasn't 
in, in English or in the immediate humanities. Uh, he was actually doing human biology, and he was following a track in environmental sciences. And the reason he came to talk to me was because he was a writer, and he had been writing, and he wanted to continue that, even though he had a very full schedule in science. Now, that didn't surprise me in itself. A program like ours in creative writing, which offers classes in that, is open to every student at Stanford. All my colleagues in creative writing, Elizabeth Talent and Tobias Wolf and Ken Fields and Adam Johnson, all of them fiction writers or poets, deeply believe that no one should have to give up their dreams of expression or their hopes of excellence or their determination to put their life in language because they come to university. We are committed to the idea that wherever a Stanford student goes, into the sciences, mathematics, and bio, the dreams can and should follow him. So we have a creative writing emphasis within the major, and we have a creative writing minor, which is what this student wanted to do. So the student, who was exceptionally good at science, went ahead with his creative writing minor. Every now and again, he came back to me to talk about his studies and tell me how he was doing with the mix of science and language, which he'd set out, out on. But as time went on, he came to see me. Our conversations were less and less about his courses. We talked about something else. We talked about it continually. And what I remember most are those conversations. This student was particularly interested in a bird whose survival was threatened. It was a red-footed bird that inhabited the Galapagos Islands. Its survival was threatened by intensive fishing that happened in the local waters, by coastal development, and by the diminishing of that bird's food supply. Now, although I didn't know the bird, hadn't tracked its path, I did know something coming from a small country about things that are threatened. Our native language in Ireland, our folk memories, our small beautiful stretches of coast, I understood them and the threat to them as part of my heritage, and I understood that this student saw in some wide, generous way that this bird and the threat to this bird was part of his heritage. Now, in his junior year, when the student was thinking of the future and graduate work, he came to see me again. He had been to the Galapagos Islands as part of a field trip for sophomores, which Stanford offers. And when he was there, I imagine they were ringing the birds. He told me he was able to actually lift up that bird with its red feet and its threatened future, lift it up and hold on to it, and he told me it made a huge impression on him as he held on to the bird to think that it might not be there in 20 or 30 years and that it might have vanished from his earth and its own. So of course he wanted to be part of the company that was trying to save that bird. And of course I could see what that would mean. But as he was leaving my office, he made a comment that I remembered for a long time. He spoke about the sight of the bird together with the long-term goals of climate change and environmental protection. Slightly different focuses, slightly different language. One was almost a personal vision and the other was a practical long-term purpose that would affect his future and his career. One was visionary and one was pragmatic, but within his education at Stanford, he'd been able to unite them. He summed it up as he went out and used a very eloquent phrase to me. He said that between his writing and his visit to the Galapagos Islands, he had been inspired. And then as he left the room, he said, and from the inspiration comes the aspiration. Whenever I remember that phrase, it seems to me to describe clearly the strengths of a liberal education, what your education at Stanford will offer you. And there's an epilogue to this story. Of course, I wrote to the student before I spoke today, who is now a graduate here in environmental sciences. I wanted to be sure he would be all right with me referring to his academic choices even anonymously, and he was glad that I did. His email, which I also have permission to quote, has a very relevant sentence. He wrote was, 
what he wrote was, I do think that doing both a creative writing minor and a human biology major with an environmental science focus was one of the best experiences of my Stanford undergraduate time. Not only did my time in a small atoll in the Pacific, the Palmyra Atoll, give rise to short stories, but the creative class, writing classes I took enriched and informed my environmental studies. That student chose, as you may yourselves, two very different fields of study. At first glance, they couldn't be more different. We think of science, after all, as having a prevailing ethos of research and evidence, whereas creative writing appears to have almost the opposite. It has an expressive disregard for the frontiers of logic. So it's not simply that the student did two different tracks and graduated with them. It was that he was able to see, he was encouraged to see, how these two very different tracks could become one purpose, and within that purpose, that he could find his voice as an intellectual and a person. And he could do so, because at Stanford University, through its own commitment to liberal education, he was encouraged to see how two apparently different parts of education, which would once have been kept well apart, and which represented two parts of his own passions, could actually relate to each other and confirm each other. So when the student picked up that bird at the Galapagos Islands, I have no doubt that science, what he learned in science at Stanford, helped him understand its fragile future. But I also don't doubt that the imagination he fostered in creative writing helped him to understand how precious that reality is and always will be to our human one. And this, therefore, is just one example, but it's a memorable one of the true gifts of a liberal education. And that does, as I say, constitute my third point about what such an education can achieve. Like this student, I do think it's important, and it was important to me when I went to Trinity, to know there may be no conflict, no division, and no separation between the gifts and interests you brought with you to Stanford and those you will direct towards your education and your future career. I think you will find at Stanford the creativity is not confined to the humanities and analysis is not exclusive to science. We have scientists here and political scientists and novelists and musicians and doctors and poets and entrepreneurs. They all talk to each other. They all connect with one another, and you can connect with them. The points I have made this morning are really intended just to be a very small beginning of a very much larger conversation. And the great thing about that conversation is that it's one you can, and I truly believe should, join and be a part of. I think it's very exciting now that for the first time there is a fascinating course beginning here called Education as self-fashioning. You can see just from the language of it what it means, that term. The idea that you become an agent of change in your own education. It, in turn, is going to sponsor a lecture series which will happen on Fridays and continue throughout this fall at Stanford. That, that lecture series is required if you're doing the course of education as self-fashioning. But if you're not doing the course, the lectures are still entirely open to you, and I think they would be a great opportunity for freshmen to listen to some ways of thinking about how their education is changing, how it will change them, how they can have an input. Um, there will be really wonderful lectures, some from Stanford faculty, some from guest lecturers, and they will set in context the issues in front of you as students today you will be able at those lectures to hear the widest series of views on the education which is now your education and the role it can play in your life as a contemporary student. By attending those lectures and by joining that conversation, you might even make better and more informed choices as you go forward. And the, the whole conversation gives you a great chance to weigh and consider and talk with your friends and your peers about how will you approach your future in, in the future and how will you approach your education now. <laughs>
When Ken Kesey was at Stanford, he brought his great gifts and he wrote that great book. But years later, he said to a journalist, I would rather be a lightning rod than a seismograph. If he was in the audience today with you, we would be able to tell him that now at Stanford, he could be both. But he's not here, and I'm not sure he wasn't both anyway. Welcome to Stanford, and thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.